thank you uh, for those of you that have come today. Um, we have a great presentation for you um, for a project that's finishing up. Um, if you're not aware, we have multiple projects on alternative fuels um, sponsored by the research division at the Air Resources Board. Uh, we've had several projects that completed uh, this year to look at the potential to produce alternative fuels in California. Um, for example, we had one project on renewable natural gas and another on drop-in fuels. Um, we also have a project on um, hydrogen, looking at um, renewable uh, life cycle analyses for uh, renewable hydrogen. Um, and that will be completed soon, and we'll have a seminar for that in the next um, several months. And then, um, you know, and then we have projects like this that are looking uh, to provide us with insight on how to transition to zero um, emission transportation technologies uh, in the future. And um, if you're uh, listening to the webcast online, you can submit comments that we can address at the end of the seminar um, by uh, emailing the address on the um, information page for the seminar. Uh, and then I just also wanted to give a plug if you're not already on the research uh, listserv to please sign up and you'll get information about uh, seminars uh, that are coming out for completed uh, research projects from uh, the Air Resources Board and other information like final reports. Um, but uh, with that, I'll uh, kick off this seminar by introducing Joan Ogden. Um, Dr. Ogden's uh, primary research interests are in uh, techno-economic assessments of low-carbon energy technologies, especially alternative fuels, hydrogen fuel cells, and renewable energy. She is a professor of environmental science and founding director of the Sustainable Transportation Energy Pathways Program, also known as STEPS, at uh, UC uh, Davis. And with that, I'll hand the mic over to her. Well, thanks very much, Sarah. And it's a, a pleasure to be here and uh, see folks from ARB, including some of my old students who are now here. So uh, anyway, I'm going to talk today about the concept of using natural gas, uh, a lower carbon transport fuel, as a bridge to eventual zero emission transport fuel hydrogen. Um, as you all uh, probably know, uh, uh, natural gas consumption for vehicles in California has been going up over the last, uh, last few years. And, uh, and we now have um, something on the order of 50,000 uh, heavy and medium duty uh, natural gas vehicles uh, running around. And, um, and this trend is, is uh, something that could continue. Um, and they're also on the horizon, of course, though, are uh, interest in zero emission vehicles, both in light duty and more recently for heavy duty applications. And uh, we now also um, want to show this slide, which shows uh, one of the reasons that natural gas is, is uh, uh, gaining popularity as a, a transportation fuel, which is the lower cost uh, versus diesel for these applications, fuel cost. So that's been another driver, uh, along with the uh, large amount of natural gas, low cost gas that's become available through the, the shale gas revolution. I see my colleague Amy Jaffe here too, and, and she can certainly answer lots of questions about the natural gas supply. So looking a little further into the future, a number of energy economic studies have been done looking at what the transport sector might look like if we were able to meet long-term goals for um, climate change. So these are two kind of typical results from a study by the International Energy Agency that shows uh, two possible futures. One is a so-called four degree future, that's the one on the left. And on the right is a two degree future, that is one where we're able to uh, limit the uh, global average temperature rise to 2C by doing various measures to the energy system. This is just looking at one part of the energy system, the light duty vehicle markets. And what we see in both these pictures, but especially in the one where you have more stringent carbon goals, uh, we see a lot of electric drive vehicles emerging in this future fleet. And these include both battery uh, vehicles and hydrogen fuel cell vehicles. So it's likely these could play a prominent role uh, in the future if we're in a low carbon world where we have deep cuts of carbon coming up. One interesting thing to note is the, there's a relatively small kind of dark blue bar down third from the bottom there, which is natural gas. So these um, scenarios see natural gas and hydrogen 
and electricity coexisting as future fuels. So it's not going to be, the future is not likely to be a winner take all proposition. So what we wanna do is look at what's going on currently with natural gas and see if this could be a bridge to this large scale use of hydrogen that many of these models are projecting in a low carbon future transport system. So just some questions that we wanted to look at in thinking about natural gas as a bridge to, to hydrogen uh, in transportation in particular. What are the likely roles that natural gas and hydrogen might play in different transport applications, light duty, heavy duty, buses, trucks, and so on? Um, and also, what infrastructure or fuel supply options could supply natural gas or hydrogen to vehicles? Um, and if we have a natural gas refueling infrastructure that we've put in place in California, or putting in place in California now, would it be possible to adapt some of that or reuse it for hydrogen? If we're in a really low carbon future where we see this big uptake of hydrogen happening, uh, could natural gas equipment be repurposed or even designed from the beginning for future hydrogen compatibility? And this is an idea that's come up as we see natural gas growing and this possibility of hydrogen growing in a low carbon world. Um, and then we also wanted to look a little bit at how the, the growth of these markets might impact infrastructure development. Are there any synergies? Are these things going to overlap, uh, compete, um, so on? And finally, we wanted to talk about the concept of power to gas. The idea there is that you can take uh, renewable, sort of excess renewable solar or wind electricity that would otherwise be curtailed and use this to make hydrogen electrolytically. The hydrogen could then be used uh, in the energy system. And one idea that connects with natural gas is the idea of injecting this hydrogen into the existing natural gas system and then transporting hydrogen as a blend with natural gas. So can you blend this in? And is that a way to kind of have a win-win? You capture some of this uh, excess renewable energy that would otherwise be curtailed or wasted. And probably all of you have heard of the duck curve. That's one example in California where uh, we're dealing with the uh, the mismatch in supply and demand for electricity with, with uh, variable renewables. So is this a way of capturing that energy? Um, and when would blending renewable hydrogen into natural gas, would that be an attractive path that could lead to pure hydrogen? So how do we go from um, you know, blending in hydrogen at some concentration to start with, maybe you know, sort of ramping it up over time, is that gonna lead to pure hydrogen transportation that we're gonna need in 2050? So that's a, a, a question. So we did uh, some simulations and uh, some calculations and, and so on, scenarios really for the future to try to explore some of these questions. And this was part of a larger study that Amy led and a number of us at Davis worked on looking at the natural gas system and zero emission future fuels, which include not only hydrogen, but uh, uh, renewable natural gas and, and so on. So this study though today is about hydrogen. So uh, first thing we did was to try to look at what transportation applications might be most suitable for hydrogen and for natural gas, and look to see if there was any overlap. And we relied here on a number of other studies that we'd done separately on, let's say, the future of LNG and trucking. We did some on hydrogen infrastructure build out. And we put all of these together to sort of look at where the, and where the current emphasis is. So technically speaking, it's possible to use uh, CNG is compressed natural gas, so that's the gaseous form. LNG is liquefied. Same thing for hydrogen, gaseous, compressed gas, and liquefied. So we found that at present, um, the emphasis in hydrogen is on light duty vehicles. So you've probably seen the Toyota Mirai and the, the Honda Clarity, the Tucson, um, Hyundai Tucson, and all of those are fuel cell cars and the other manufacturers are coming along. There are over a thousand of these on California roads now. That's been kind of the push. But recently there's also been interest in uh, having hydrogen to power buses, uh, fleet trucks, um, possibly even liquid hydrogen in long haul. Toyota's just announced an entry in that, in that field. So these are all technically possible things that you can do um, with hydrogen. Uh, also, same markets in natural gas. The heavier due to the application, you'll notice those tend to use liquefied versions of the fuels because it's more energy dense. So it's easier to get enough energy on board to send a truck uh, on, around uh, with the liquid hydrogen. So the emphasis uh, though, in terms of what manufacturers are introducing, hydrogen has been light duty vehicle, growing interest in buses and trucks, but probably these won't be really commercial for perhaps something like seven to 15 years of fuel cell partnership, California uh, fuel cell partnership estimated. Uh, and for CNG, these buses and so on already exist 
and are out there. And it's a uh, thought that CNG may have some growing additional use in delivery trucks and things like that. And that LNG, importantly, might uh, play a major role as a long haul truck fuel. So uh, kind of different markets. Uh, the market's a bit segmented there between what we think hydrogen is going to serve and natural gas. Just to note that um, in uh, CNG, in, in, although it's used in, in passenger cars in other countries around the world, has not really caught on in the US. So there are very few of these operating. So really, when we look to the future, and remember that graph with the light duty picture with the electric drive, the hydrogen, and the batteries ramping up to be lots of them, we're thinking that that's going to be kind of the emphasis. So um, somewhat segmented market. Uh, this is also uh, what was found in a, a study by the DOE when they looked at this issue about two or three years ago. So let's now move on to how we supply these markets, what kind of infrastructure we're going to use. And uh, I'm going to put a kind of a complicated slide up there and spend a few minutes on, on this one. So the idea here is we want to look at how you supply natural gas today and how you might supply hydrogen in the future and what kind of overlap there might be. Would it actually be possible to take some of the natural gas infrastructure and convert any of that to hydrogen? So the top three um, uh, lines up there, supply lines, we start on the left-hand side with the primary fuel. So we're starting with natural gas, right? And then we go to central processing, and we're looking at three different lines. One is CNG, and there are two LNG options. So you either make LNG in central processing in a big plant and send it in a truck along uh, to storage and then dispense it as LNG, or you can send natural gas to a, a small LNG plant, actually at the refueling station, LNG in a box, and make LNG that way. You can send CNG, you can just send uh, natural gas in the pipeline right to the station, you compress it, put it in your car. So those are three pathways. Now I'd say, can those pathways, can any of those be converted to hydrogen? So then we also laid out a bunch of hydrogen pathways, and those are the, the six pathways or, uh, shown below there. So there's different ways to do that. Start with natural gas, and in the top one, we send natural gas all the way to the station, and we have a small device called the steam methane reformer, SMR, that can convert methane to hydrogen. So we do that at the station, dispense it to a hydrogen car, put it in MRI. That's one option. Another option is making hydrogen at central scale. And so you have natural gas going into a big steam methane reformer, and then you can store hydrogen in different forms. You can either put it on a truck as a gas or as a, a liquid, cryogenic liquid, ship that to the hydrogen station, store it, dispense it to your hydrogen car. Or uh, you also um, could uh, have a, um, a gas pipeline. You could make hydrogen at big scale uh, centrally and then put it into a pipeline, a hydrogen dedicated pipeline to the, um, to the station. And all three of these have been looked at them in numerous studies trying to figure out what's the best way to move hydrogen around. And it's really a fun problem. I've worked on it a bunch. And many other people at UC and, and CARB have worked on that. So the bottom um, entry is kind of interesting, too. Right at the bottom, there are two pathways that are blended natural gas and hydrogen. So that's the idea we were talking about before. And there, you might make the hydrogen from uh, excess renewable power and electrolyzer. You could make it from other things. And then you blend it into a natural gas line. So you make this hydrogen, compress it up to a high pressure so you can shoot it into the natural gas line, and then mix it up with natural gas and send it on its way. So the blend can then be used as a fuel. And, it, and up to a certain point, which I'll discuss in a minute, it's OK to blend hydrogen. You could actually use it in the natural gas system without uh, too many problems. Um, and, and so you could do that. You'd have a greener fuel, perhaps, if you were blending in electrolytic hydrogen from renewables. You have a renewable component. Um, and the other option is, but that, that actually is um, OK for some applications, but it's not so great for transportation. And the reason is, or you lose something, you could, you could combust this fuel, this blend fuel, in an internal combustion engine. You could tune it up for hydrogen mixtures, and there's been a lot of work done on that. But um, you don't get as much efficiency as you would in a fuel cell. So what you really want to do if you have hydrogen is use it in a fuel cell vehicle. You get a higher efficiency. You get lower emissions out the tailpipe. You're a true zero. 
emissions. So if you're going for that long-term future with the big wedge of zero emission, you really want to use the hydrogen in transportation as pure hydrogen in a fuel cell. And that means that the blend, just burning it as a blend, is not, such a, not a big deal, really. You don't gain that much. Um, but you might if you could separate the hydrogen from the blend. So that's the other idea. You send this mix down there, and then you get the mix to the station, and you have a device, a separation device, that skims out the hydrogen. So those are the pathways. Um, and they, they kind of uh, encompass most of the overlap for transportation between natural gas and hydrogen. So could we reuse any of the stuff in the top three pathways in, in the bottom three? And so I made another graph that basically has all of these pathways, all of these nine pathways, and all the stages, only now I've color-coded it. So the green parts are OK. You could take a, if that was in a natural gas station, you want to switch to hydrogen, fine. But those parts aren't very interesting because they're basically like natural gas coming into the station and stuff like the card reader and the convenience store on the other side. All the stuff in between, some of it's colored kind of an orange color. That means you can't swap it out. So it turns out some of the pathways for, uh, for natural gas, you just can't convert to hydrogen. You have LNG pathway, you can't convert that to hydrogen. You can't store hydrogen. It's a different uh, temperature. There's a lot of things that are different technically, so it's impossible, really. And the only things where there might be a chance of using, taking a natural gas component, using hydrogen in it, are compressed gas systems. So CNG station, if you had a compressor or a hydrogen tank, you could ask the question, could I build this so it could be compatible with hydrogen as well as natural gas? And maybe yes. Um, and, but the, um, the other one is the natural gas pipeline itself. And we talked about this blending idea. So, uh, we have uh, a couple of possibilities there um, to look at. It turns out that um, if we try to convert these uh, compressors, let me just see where that slide is. If we try to com convert the compressors in the CNG station to hydrogen compatibility, it doesn't fly economically. The basic reason is that hydrogen storage costs a lot more than natural gas storage. And that's shown here. The hydrogen costs are the little red dots at top, and the natural gas costs are the little blue triangles at the bottom. If you want to overbuild for compatibility, you're going to have to build such a gold-plated station to start with for CNG that nobody's going to do it for a number of reasons. One is we're not quite sure when the hydrogen is coming. But another is even if it was coming tomorrow, or let's say within two or three years, the benefits wouldn't pay back uh, what, you're, uh, what you're asking of it. So that's kind of a non-starter. Um, let's now, though, go to talking about um, some of the other things that might work. Uh, so we just looked at different infrastructure transitions here, kind of two sets of ideas. Hydrogen grows organically out of natural gas. We just kind of ruled out the overbuild CNG part. But that leaves the idea of blending renewable hydrogen uh, into the system and power to gas as something we want to explore a little more. And then, of course, the other option is you could just build a dedicated hydrogen infrastructure and not worry about the natural gas, repurposing the natural gas pipeline. Maybe you have a right of way alongside and you build a hydrogen line. That's kind of the other option. Okay. So let's talk a little about um, using hydrogen blends. Um, but before we do that, I'm going to talk, I'm going to present a scenario that we put together. Uh, for California, looking out to 2035, not all the way to 2050, but 2035, and looking at some ideas for how, how much we think natural gas markets are going to grow in that time frame and hydrogen markets. So we're trying to get an idea for one thing. Is hydrogen going to completely be replacing natural gas in this time frame, or what, what is going to happen there? And so we came up with some scenarios for a couple of things. Hydrogen light duty vehicles, and there we drew on work by CARB and CEC and the number of, of planners who have looked at the rollout of the hydrogen infrastructure, fuel cell partnership. We looked at LNG for long haul trucks, and that builds on some work that Amy and some of her colleagues at Davis did, looking at uh, LNG trucking, uh, did a really nice spatial model for California, looking at the possibilities for that. And then we looked at the possibilities for using hydrogen and CNG in fleet trucks and delivery trucks and buses and things like that. So there are kind of three things. There's a the long haul market, that's going to be mostly LNG. The light duty vehicles, that's going to be mostly hydrogen. And then the fleet vehicles, which we're going to look at both. 
And we also estimated how much infrastructure you'd need for each, these app, each of these scenarios, each of these applications, looking at how much fuel we need to dispense, how many stations, and talk a little about the spatial layout of the networks that would serve. Serving passenger vehicles is really different than serving long haul trucks, for example. Passenger vehicles, you need stations that the consumers can access easily and will allow them to travel around. That's really different than a truck going up the freeway and you know it stops at big stations, a few of them. So different layout, let's talk about that. So let's talk first about the number of vehicles in this scenario. And this work was done by a couple of my colleagues, um, and myself at UC Davis, uh, Marshall Miller uh, at Davis is kind of the lead guy on that. And so we're developing a big model that's gonna let us put in kind of what if scenarios for transitions in transportation. So this is one such one. Well, now we're talking about just medium and heavy duty vehicles in this slide. So, um, so we have, and we have five different time frames down at the bottom there. 2015 is over on the left, then 2020, 2025, 30, and 35. And we have three different uh, fuel types. We have hydrogen, um, and then we have CNG, and we have LNG. Um, and the LNG uh, in this is used mostly for long haul. Uh, the CNG is used for trucks, medium and duty and uh, heavy duty. And hydrogen in this is trucks. So a couple of things. The CNG is the middle bar. That's the one with the yellow and green on top. Those are buses and vocational trucks, things like garbage trucks and, and other trucks like that. Um, and we see that bar over time is growing slowly. So in this scenario, we still have a little growth in the CNG world, um, a few more trucks and buses, and getting used in delivery vans more. And that, but that is a slow growth. That contrasts with fast growth in this scenario for LNG and for hydrogen. So let's do LNG is the blue bar. That's the blue bar over on the right in each time frame. And that starts growing around 2025 and, and grows pretty rapidly in terms of the number of LNG trucks based on the study that Amy and her uh, colleagues did. Um, and then with hydrogen, similar for the trucks and buses, We've, it's going to be a little while before those things are available. So starting around 2025, we see those lifting off. And they're also used in similar things to the CNG. They're used in medium duty trucks and buses and drayage trucks and that, that kind of thing. And maybe eventually they'll also be used in long haul if uh, Toyota's uh, portal project gets going. So, um, so anyway, this is a picture of slow growth for CNG. And then starting around 2025, some rapid growth for both LNG and long haul and hydrogen in a variety of truck and, and bus type applications. Um, so we're not replacing CNG. We're not retiring CNG in this, really. We're, but it's not growing as fast. And both of these things are displacing diesel. But we're, we're not you know, wholesale swapping out the CNG stations yet um, So in this scenario. And this is based on um, kind of a, you know, existing policies kind of landscape and a number of industrial um, announcements and some scenarios that we did for how we think these fuels might unroll. Okay, now keep this in mind. Now I'm gonna add light duty vehicles to the number picture. And here we have light duty vehicles. Now the hydrogen light duty vehicles, after, starting after about 2025, the numbers just swamp all the numbers of, of other vehicles. So we're at 4 million fuel cell vehicles by 2035. And that's uh, consistent with a number of studies that have been done uh, looking at these low carbon futures, including energy economic models for the state of California and so on. Um, and so by 2025, we're at about uh, 200,000, which is uh, a fraction of the 1.5 you know, million kind of number that we uh, have for a goal. So we're not assuming that Fuel cells, uh, fuel cells are coming on a bit after the, uh, the electric vehicles, but they do come to, to play a big role. So uh, that's interesting. And now let's see what this translates to. And the trucks, by the way, and all the, or all the buses rather than trucks, are those, those little tiny things there. They're down at about you know, 50,000, 80,000 units. So on this scale, where the, the light duty vehicle market takes off, they look pretty small in numbers of vehicles. Let's now look at numbers of stations. And um, so again, 2015, 2020, 2025, 2030, each of those groupings. And the kind of dark bar there with CNG, that stays about the same. The number of stations is a slower growing market. Number of stations stays about the same, but we're not retiring stations. 
And then we have growth of LNG stations and hydrogen stations for cars uh, showing up after 2025. One thing is that the number of, of uh, stations for light duty vehicles is larger than the number of stations for these truck fleets. And that makes sense. We've got you know, millions of these running around. They need to have a lot of stations for consumers to have access. So the number of stations is, is higher. Um, and, but the, um, the number of stations for the, uh, the trucks uh, grows uh, more gradually. There's also, we find, uh, sort of a spatial segmentation. There's not that much spatial overlap between where we think the natural gas stations are and the hydrogen stations. The hydrogen stations, most of them, are for passenger cars. So they're kind of like where our gasoline stations would be now. They're in urban areas, a few connector stations, and so on. Uh, they're also, hydrogen does have some fleets, so they're going to be fleet stations. And those would tend to be maybe one station at the garage or a couple of stations that would serve a fleet, something like a bus or a truck that went back and forth to a port. Now, that's where the overlap happens with CNG. CNG be serving some of those same kind of applications. And then LNG uh, would be more highway stations along freeways for this long haul trucking. So the point is that the stations are not going to overlap spatially. It's also technically not and economically not desirable to take a, a CNG station and try to turn it into a hydrogen station. So uh, we think these things are going to be somewhat separate in how they evolve uh, on an infrastructure point of view because of this market segmentation that also leads to kind of a spatial segmentation. So that's, um, so that's, that's interesting. And uh, it also says that we're really going to be thinking about serving these different markets. There'll be some integration uh, among it, among these markets perhaps, but they also have their own individual considerations and that impacts the infrastructure uh, layout. So let's now go, uh, let's now turn to talking uh, for the next, uh, next couple of slides here about power to gas, okay? The idea there is you take power from renewable energy um, and often uh, talk about curtailed power or power that can't be accepted by the grid. There's a, too much um, you know, say generation of solar at the time to, meet, you know, to match the supply. Taking that and um, running an electrolyzer, which will split water to make hydrogen and oxygen, you put the electricity in, and then storing that hydrogen and doing various things with it. So you could use the hydrogen industry, you could reconvert it back uh, to make electric power and feed it back into the grid. So, you know, storing that renewable power and energy to make power later. You also could fuel vehicles with that hydrogen, or you could blend it into the natural gas lines. So since we're talking about kind of the synergy with natural gas, kind of talk about that option. Okay. There are about 30 of these power to gas projects in Europe, and there's several in the United States. And there's a lot of interest in storing this intermittent renewable electricity um, and their potential benefits to this idea. So let's talk a little about that. Why would, why would we do this? Um, well, you'd have a market if for curtailed power, for wind or solar power. The, the producer of that, you know, the owner of that wind farm or solar installation uh, now has to curtail that power. That's a loss. Can't sell it. It's uneconomic. It could become economic if there were a market for this hydrogen produced by electrolysis. So that's a, an interesting thing. Um, and if you blend in green hydrogen, say made from solar or wind, in with natural gas, and up to a certain point, and we'll discuss in a minute, you can put that blend gas into the natural gas system. But the gas now has a lower carbon content than it had before, or a lower, uh, you know, and that means that you'll have less carbon emissions when you burn that in a, a burner uh, or you know, throughout the system, combust that. Uh, some have said this might author a smooth transition from natural gas to hydrogen by offering this blend, and then you could ratchet up the amount of hydrogen. Uh, actually, when I looked at that, that's pretty tough to do without a lot of expense of redoing the natural gas system. Just a quick story, too. In the, um, uh, back in the 1930s and 40s, there, it, there was a law passed which allowed interstate commerce in, in natural gas. And that uh, did away with the so-called town gas industry, which was every city had its own little gas plant, and they would gasify coal or waste or wood and make a gas that was about half hydrogen plus some CO, a little bit of methane. And that's what got pumped around your houses back in the day. And so back in the, but when natural gas was allowed to be traveled across straight li state lines, that set off a whole industry in building pipelines up the East Coast into the West 
And now the natural gas from the Gulf Coast could be used as a fuel. It was a better quality fuel than this town gas and safer. So uh, they went through all the buildings. And I know people in New York City who remember this when they were kids, when they went through and changed all the burners and changed the pipe fittings and changed the meters, and voila, it was ready for natural gas. So you could go back the other way in theory, but it would cost a lot to do it. So anyway, um, so this tr smooth transition, it's, it would be expensive. But it's, it's a possibility. And then also, it could potentially potentially lower the cost of using hydrogen by using this existing pipeline infrastructure instead of having to build a new one. Maybe. That, that's uh, something that uh, dep depends on the site. But that's a possibility. And you also could store that renewable energy as hydrogen now, electrical, take the excess solar, make hydrogen. And instead of having to build a big uh, underground storage cavern or something for that hydrogen, you could stuff it in the pipeline. So those are all benefits that people see this approach. But there also are issues in blending hydrogen in with natural gas. And a, a couple of them are uh, things like embrittlement, uh, leakage. Uh, there could be safety issues with hydrogen. Hydrogen is a much smaller molecule than natural gas, so it will leak more uh, preferentially. It also will embrittle materials. It's not compatible with all the steels that are found and the materials that are found in the natural gas system. So um, there have been extensive studies of how much hydrogen you could get away with. And it really depends on the system. So you'd have to know where it is. But as a rule of thumb, people often say 5 to 15% hydrogen by volume would probably be OK. But I must say, before I put hydrogen in any system, I, did, I would want to know everything that was in there. And also the state of the pipes, the, the state, you know, do you have cracks? Do you have welds that are a little flaky? All those things are sites where embrittlement can take place. So you don't want to put hydrogen in, in that in, into the lines if that's what's going on. And the appropriate blend concentration can vary quite a lot, depending on where you are in the gas system, exactly when it was built, what materials were used. In Europe, um, they have uh, I, a lot of different countries have different standards for how much hydrogen is allowed. And it varies from 0.1% to 12%. So, and that's based on the assessment of their particular grid. And so it's, uh, that's an issue. And I, I don't know that that, I don't think that's been done. That's actually a recommendation that it would be very good to do an assessment like that for California, um, which I don't believe has been done in that, in that kind of detail. Also, so you need extensive checking. You'd need to have monitoring. You'd need to um, really uh, be sure that you had a safe uh, system and the integrity of the system if you add hydrogen. And the extra cost for this would have to be weighed against the benefit of, um, of providing a lower carbon fuel. And this is a kind of a case by case thing. It's, it's hard to generalize, but you really need to look at a, you know, look regionally at this, this question. So let's now say, what about using hydrogen blends for transportation? And as I was talking about earlier, you can use these directly in modified internal combustion engine vehicles, use hydrogen blends. But fuel cell vehicles need pure hydrogen. And they're a lot more efficient, and they're strictly zero. So if we want to get the pure hydrogen, what we'd have to do is separate that out of the mixture. So imagine we have this mixture of hydrogen and natural gas going through a pipeline. We take that gas out, run it through a separator, and we recover maybe 80% of the hydrogen would be typical. For, and there's different methods to do this. The recovery generally involves a pressure drop. So you have high pressure stuff coming in one side and low pressure coming out the other side. So, um, but the separate, then separation has costs and energy requirements. And so that adds to the cost of getting this pure hydrogen back. So you're mixing this stuff up. You have this pure hydrogen that you want for fuel cells. You have to separate it at the other end. Uh, just a picture of how much these costs are. Just for reference, uh, people talk about fairly near-term delivered costs for hydrogen in the 5 to $7 a kilogram range. It's maybe in, uh, something around 10 or over now. And in the long term, maybe getting down to around 4. P uh, extraction or separation at pressure is shown for two different situations. The one on the left um, is imagine you're separating hydrogen at a refueling station somewhere. So you have a natural gas line going by the refueling station. You take the hydrogen out. Now you have some natural gas left, and it's dropped in pressure. So you have to recompress it so you can put it back in the pipeline. So that actually costs a fair amount. And 
the size on the bottom there, the hydrogen recovery rate, that's kind of typical for how much a station might use in a day, 100 to 1,000 kilograms a day. And the dilution, 10% to 20%, that's kind of typical of what you might think how much hydrogen by volume. Well, you find that the, the numbers are between two and about $8 a kilogram. So comparing that to the five to seven, that's kind of a lot. It's, it's a fairly large add-on to, to get the pure hydrogen back. Now, people have said, well, there are clever ways to do this. Let's find a spot in the natural gas system where we have a pressure drop already. Like sometimes at a C gate, you'll have a high pressure line coming in. You drop it down to 30 PSI, and that's what goes around to your house. If you find a spot like that, then you don't have to recompress the natural gas because it just has to go back to a low pressure system. There, the cost could be lower. But now you have pure hydrogen, and is that a spot where you need a station? <laughs> It might not be. If it's a city gate, it might be out away from you know, in some industrial area. So then you're stuck with, OK, I've got this pure hydrogen, and now I have to take it to the consumers. So unless you had a, maybe if you had a use at the city gate, maybe you're next to a refinery, maybe you're next to some other user of hydrogen, that, that might work. But it's, again, case by case, really cries out for regional case studies with the GIS and optimization that my students are very good at doing stuff like that. So anyway, that, that's, it, it's, um, it's a kind of a case-by-case uh, a, a case, um, thing. One or two more slides. And um, one thing about carbon implications, uh, people often say you know, 5 to 15% hydrogen by volume. And you might, if it's green hydrogen, zero emission from solar or wind, you might think, OK, that's 5 to 10% less greenhouse gas emissions. Unfortunately, it doesn't quite work that way, because hydrogen is what's called a low BTU gas, or it has less energy per unit volume than natural gas. So if you want to replace things on an energy basis, maybe you could only tolerate between, say, 2 and 5% hydrogen in the pipeline on an energy basis. Um, so that's just uh, something to think about when thinking about this. Um, I'm going to show just one calculation. I know this calculation is immensely simplified, but I wanted to just get a rough idea, you know, zeroth order calculation on maybe how much um, you could do with this blending strategy if you took curtailed power in California, you electrolyze it, you put it in pipelines, you ship that around, and then you have some way of, of separating it and, and using it. Um, and then compare that to how much transportation fuel we might need for hydrogen out in the long term if we have, you know, let's say 25% of our cars or 50% of our cars running on hydrogen. How does that, how does that do? And, and as we talked about, with pipelines, there'll be some limits on how much hydrogen you can put in there because of these embrittlement and compatibility things. Um, and so hydrogen from curtailed solar or wind, uh, I did just like you know, a very rough calculation. There have been some estimates that maybe in a 50% renewable California grid, you'd have 5 to 10% curtailed power uh, from the renewable components on board there. Uh, the total California grid annual power, I'm going to say roughly 60 gigawatts. So if you take the average, annual average curtailed power, uh, assuming that you could multiply that 5 to 10% on the annual basis by that, uh, you might get a, you know, somewhere of about uh, 3 to 6 gigawatts curtailed power, make electrolytic hydrogen, maybe 2.5 to 5 gigawatts of hydrogen power. So how does that compare to how many vehicles that would fuel? Um, it turns out that you need about one kilowatt of power uh, to fuel a vehicle. And so that's a couple of million vehicles so that you could do from the curtailed uh, wind power. Um, now, what about the pipeline capacity? Is this going to be a bottleneck for pushing hydrogen around the state? And uh, maybe pipeline system now delivers about 70 gigawatts on an annual average basis. And the blend limit for an energy basis, because now we're talking power, so we're talking energy, not volume maybe 7 to 5%. So again, allowed hydrogen flow, maybe 1 to 3.5 gigawatts on an annual average basis. So actually, the pipeline capacity might not even be able to take this curtailed power, all of it, uh, to a rough approximation. And to do this right, you really need to get all the, you know, all the profiles for things and look at how the electric systems operated, the demand, the supply, and we'd like to do something like that to understand it. But just to a rough estimate. Now, how does, this, um, how does this compare to how much hydrogen we'll need in the long term? 
Well, we did some studies with an energy economic model called CA Times that several of my colleagues developed over at Davis. And we looked out to 2050 and looked for low, um, you know, low uh, carbon, high hydrogen scenarios. And we found that maybe something like 20 million hydrogen cars might be out there by 2050 in that scenario. And that would mean about 20 gigawatts. So of hydrogen would be needed or more. So 20 gigawatts, that's how much we need. And we're talking about a potential supply, given the limitations of the natural gas grid, possibly to be this fairly low fraction of hydrogen flow that you can support, that's about an order of magnitude less than that. So what that says is the natural gas system, um, even if you converted all of it to taking as much hydrogen blend as it could take, might not be enough to meet the future demand for hydrogen vehicles. So what do we do? We can still make a lot of hydrogen from renewables. We just will need to ship it in another distribution system. So thought is, um, and I'd really, this is all very preliminary because I'd like to do this in detail um, to understand it right. Do the, but I think what we find is that this might be a startup strategy in a few places, but you'd have to pick the places carefully. Maybe it's a pipeline with a bunch of big wind or solar farms next to her. You put the, the stuff in, you sip it down the pipeline, you, do a, you have a place where the pressure drop goes and you have some big use for it right there and you skim it back out. I suspect that kind of thing might make sense, but it might be really hard in transport. And in fact, there have been some studies in Europe that suggest this also, that it's going to be just hard because of these limitations on flow to get that through. So my last slide here, um, we've examined a couple of uh, questions on this idea of the near to midterm use of natural gas uh, transportation or the natural gas infrastructure might help in that enabled use of hydrogen. Uh, we looked at some scenario analyses for California just to get an idea of the magnitude. And we, we found that there were a number of factors that might constrain the overlap between hydrogen and natural gas um, infrastructure, practically speaking, plus the timing of this. We have natural gas now. Uh, hydrogen probably won't be coming in, in in markets where it would compete, which would be the fleet vehicles for maybe another 10 years. It doesn't look like we're going to have wholesale retirement of natural gas and a lot of stranded assets. I would say instead we'll be able to plan that decline. And eventually, if we do replace, we will replace natural gas to get to the 2050 world. That could be done in a planned uh, method. But the natural gas system itself is probably not going to be the conduit for hydrogen for 20 million vehicles. So, um, so we'd like to do some detailed case studies on this to assess the potential for electrolytic hydrogen in California, compare it to other storage options, and also to look, assess the suitability of California's natural gas pipeline system for use with hydrogen blends. So uh, I'll end there, and thanks very much. And I, Amy, did you want to add me anything? You're good, okay. Amy's my uh, partner in crime in this study. So thank you, thank you very much. Um, thanks, Joan. Appreciate that. That was really good. Um, and we're happy to take questions from the audience. Um, we haven't gotten access to the uh, questions from the internet, but uh, hopefully I'll get them in a few minutes. Um, so we can just start in the room if there are any. Uh, yes, a uh, very good presentation. Could you compare the electrolytic hydrogen as a storage medium versus the battery or other mechanism for storage that's being discussed now and you know economics and and effectiveness as far as GHC reductions that's a, that's a great question and uh, that's funny because Amy and I were just talking about that over dinner last night I, I think that is that is a study I would love to do to actually look at all of the factors involved with that. If you just look at the round trip efficiency back from, oh, let's say, renewable electricity, you store it, and then you make it back into electricity. If you look at that, the efficiency is higher with a battery storage. You might get a you know, 75, 80% round trip efficiency, maybe even more doing that. With hydrogen, you would get uh, an efficiency of perhaps 40% round trip um, to do the same thing. So that would just say, well, why don't we just do batteries? But there are other configure there are other considerations. One is what the actual variable pattern is uh, for the excess electricity or the curtailed electricity. And if you have to store a lot of that, and also the end use, you have to store a lot of that, um, and it's not just sort of straight going back to the grid, then hydrogen can actually end up being cheaper 
because in bulk storage terms, with batteries, it's a very modular technology, which is very cool. But with hydrogen, you get scale economies. So you can have large storage fields, and sometimes the economics will work out better depending on the amount of energy you need to store and the sort of duty cycle for how you need to use it. The other interesting question, of course, is what will consumers choose in terms of their light duty vehicles? And um, with um, battery vehicles are here, and now hydrogen vehicles are, are, have started commercialization. Most of the automakers are involved with both technologies and seem to see roles uh, for both if you look at future transportation. So I think, um, I think we'll see what the, that's the other part of the, it's like the market pull part of it. If we were not gonna use it for putting back in the grid, but let's say we were gonna use that um, intermittent electricity to charge batteries for transportation or to make hydrogen for transportation then you might have different applications and you might actually end up doing both. Um, um, we, I do have a question from um, Nancy, uh, Nancy Noble. She was asking, is renewable natural gas being produced anywhere inside of California's borders today and is available for sale in the public? Maybe I'll, maybe I'll ask that, that uh, was wants a, to take actually a, a topic of a, a previous uh, research project, but I'll let Amy address that. Um, the answer to that is yes. Um, some uh, resources are more commercial or profitable than others. Um, and, um, but a lot of the volume of renewable natural gas that's being used in the trucking industry in California is coming from Texas and other locations because the injection fees um, and cost to hook into the natural gas pipeline with in-state resources uh, can be quite prohibitive. Thanks, and I think we had another question in the room. Thank you, a question and a comment. Um, on storage, when you're considering storing excess uh, electricity, um, are you taking into consideration also the idea of small-scale local storage? In other words, people who are taking putting electricity into storage locally at their homes. Is that a, a configuration that you look at? Uh, no, because this is really, what I presented was a back of the envelope calculation. And I'd really love to look at the different levels of storage and different end uses. So that would come into a study like that. In, in Switzerland, there's a, a project looking at compressed air and, and transported water mm -hmm. as a way of storing energy. Yeah. And I think those are interesting When, when, I mean, you know, to do like a, a thorough analysis of the cost, you have to know, you know, what, what, you know, what different kinds of batteries can have different costs and different kind of air and pumped air storage and so forth can have different costs. When you look at the utility scale, um, people originally started with pumped air um, and some of these other systems, but now increasingly people are moving to batteries, right, which are modular. So... You know, Joan and I were trying to make a graphic and, you know, the numbers are not 100% transparent today because you have a lot of people who are in this business that have not published their, you know, competitive numbers. But there's, it, it really is going to depend on scale. So if you're talking at the household level, chances are batteries are going to be the most effective, cheapest thing to do because you're talking about a very small volume. When you start talking about a small town or utilities that would serve a sit like parts of LA, um, then I think you're gonna get into a debate which is gonna take a really careful calculation. Um, you know, how big is the service area gonna be and how much curtailed power do you have, right? So if you have, you know, if theoretically you had 50% of the wind you're, you're producing for the whole city of Los Angeles, and uh, you know, if you just think about it volumetrically, it's obviously going to be cheaper to build a giant tank that could hold hydrogen. I shouldn't say obvious, but it seems to me just knowing what I know about infrastructure, chances are the cost of having a giant storage system. You know, if you think about what is the cost to build a steel tank and compare that with the cost of how many batteries it would take to do a giant section of LA. Correct. So you, you have to look at all of those things when thinking about the comparison. So I would say, 
I'm guessing that um, the cost and so forth of having a hydrogen storage tank at your home probably would be much higher than the cost of having a battery system in your home. But when you start talking about Sacramento or Los Angeles or San Diego, um, then there might be a case where um, conversion to hydrogen makes sense. And then also you want to think about, I mean, it would be a pretty complicated study to do because you also would want to think about electricity, uh, 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 use for power generation versus vehicles. So um, if you're having, um, you're going to want to look at peak and timing, right? Because if you're going to also be servicing vehicles from the hydrogen, liquid hydrogen from that same facility, again, there might be some economy of scale or efficiency you can gain of equipment um, versus, you know, having all these charging stations attached to some utility scale. Um, and having, it's also going to depend on time of day requirement and, um, and so forth for the, you know, are you, are you needing the power for your automobile in the evening versus during the day? Um, so it, it, I think it would probably be, I mean, something that Davis would be equipped to do, but it'd probably be a pretty complicated study. Yeah, it would have to be a detailed case study of the, with the parameters. Correct. And it would be mentioned. super yeah. location specific and super, um, a function specific. What are you going to do with the curtailed power? How are you going to use it? How, what the distance is? Because probably, you know, there's a certain level where beyond which today you can't move electricity. So if you're needing to move the power to a longer distance, then you probably would want to use the hydrogen because you can ship that either by pipeline or truck. So you really would have to know what the total requirements would be. Um, great. I have another question from Jesus Sosa at SoCal Gas. Um, he asked, why are pipeline blends of um, hydrogen preferable to reformation at CNG station sites? I'm sorry. What uh, is why, uh, I guess, blending hydrogen into the pipeline is better than having CNG station sites? Okay. Um, you could, uh, you could, if you had natural gas at a site and you wanted to add a hydrogen station on the same site, then sure, do it. Put a small SMR there and make the, make the uh, hydrogen for the vehicle. That would certainly work out. And that, um, so that would be, depending on the economics of the situation, how many vehicles you had, that might be a really fine thing to do. Um, I guess what I was saying is if you were going to say, I'm going to take the tanks that had CNG and stick hydrogen in them, that would not be an okay thing to do. And that would be really expensive if you built the CNG station saying, I'm going to start putting hydrogen in, in it. So that, that's, the, that's the comparison. Yeah, and let me, um, just to kind of go back to something Joan was saying with all her charts, um, that really is very fundamental. So you have a CNG system developing now. You're all aware of that because you can see UPS or you know, your local delivery trucks coming and they're using this, the CNG system. So when people thought about this question about hydrogen, um, they were thinking about the cost of the high cost of starting out from scratch and the chicken and egg problem of building new hydrogen pipelines, new hydrogen stations, new hydrogen um, dispensaries. And they're thinking about, you know, doing all that from scratch was going to be so costly you know, was there some way to just use the existing CNG system to do the same thing, right? And, you know, as we looked at it over time, you know, there are a lot of challenges involved in, you know, so-called using um, this existing natural gas. First of all, you need to know what do you believe the timeline is where you're going to retire this natural gas and you're not going to need the infrastructure anymore and you're going to replace it with hydrogen. Right. And is that timeline going to be, you know, like I can imagine 10 years, 20 years, 30 years where I'm ending up at hydrogen and I'm going to stop using natural gas. Right. But when you look at the large resources we have in the state that could be biomethane converted to renewable natural gas and the carbon balance that that might provide, because you're actually capturing methane that would otherwise, you know, emit to the atmosphere. Um, and you look at the timeline of that and how much landfill we already have in the state, maybe those resources are going to be produced contiguously at the same time. 
So 10 years from now, we're gonna to wanna to be putting renewable natural gas into these CNG stations. So we're not really gonna to want to be converting them to hydrogen. And also it's super expensive to convert them to hydrogen. If you are building a new CNG station today, that station is only going to physically last for 15 years probably. That's sort of the, the shelf life for a station. And so then you have to ask yourself, do you need that state? If you built it today and you spend 30 or 40 or 50% more to make it with the steel and other kind of equipment that it could be hydrogen ready, in 15 years, you're gonna maybe be retiring that station anyway. And do you actually need it for hydrogen in the next 15 years? Probably not, right? So, so really when you look at the practicality of how big a renewable natural gas industry could we have in the state and how long would you want that renewable natural gas industry to last? And then going into uh, Joan's presentation, which shows you, you know, how little hydrogen you could blend into the existing natural gas pipelines um, without completely changing the liners and all the equipment that goes with it. It's such a small volume compared to how much hydrogen we're hoping to get out into the system on the road in cars and other kinds of vehicles and trucks. Um, it's very hard to make everything align to say that the natural gas infrastructure is going to be the best facilitator for this transition. Because probably in 2030 and 2040, when we're going to be doing all of this at a much higher volume, um, you would still usefully be able to use the biomethane and still want to use and get rid of the biomethane from different industries, from our wastewater industry and from our municipal waste industry, right? Um, and you probably still have landfill gas left because there's so much landfill gas. So, you know, it's not clear that the timeline is such that it really pays you to use the natural gas industry for the transition. Um, and with the time left, maybe we'll take one more question from the room, if there is one. Um, I'm Brandon Rose with Air Resources Board. Um, one of the sort of things I haven't heard today is carbon intensity. Um, and if really the bridge to the future is getting to as near to a low carbon future as possible, um, would you have a little bit of commentary on that um, area? Yeah, I, I think uh, getting to a low carbon future, if you are looking at either hydrogen or electricity in, in the transport sector, there are many uh, resources for making this without worrying about the interaction with the natural gas system. Now saying that's going to maybe happen, have a transitional role, but it's at you know, one-tenth scale kind of what we're talking about with hydrogen. So I, I think um, you know, we'll have, uh, we can produce hydrogen from renewables many different ways. We know how to ship it around. There are uh, technologies for hydrogen infrastructure to ship this by pipes and trucks and you know, multiple uh, different uh, modalities for infrastructure. So I think we would see a gradual buildup of, of that on the infrastructure side, as well as I, I would see, you know, complementary roles with electricity and hydrogen in, in transportation. All right, well, thank you everyone um, who came to the seminar and thank you, uh, Amy and Joan for a great presentation. Um, uh, yeah, so uh, again, please join our research listserv for information about future seminars and uh, the final report for this uh, project is available online on the project website, so please go check that out. Thanks. Okay, thanks.